All right, so in a video this week, Pete Hudson introduced the concepts of eradication and elimination. So elimination being the, uh, the reduction of disease to zero or infection to zero in any, in any uh, specific area and, and uh, eradication being the global elimination from all areas of uh, any natural infection with, with a pathogenic agent. And uh, many of us can imagine that getting rid of pathogens would be a great thing, right? All of these things that make us sick, you know, we, we, our lives in principle sound like they'd be a lot better if we could get rid of them. So the questions are, what are the challenges to eradication? Why have, why have we only been successful with, at present, eradicating two pathogens, smallpox, um, and rinderpest, thanks. <laughs> Smallpox and rinderpest. Um, and what are the challenges with setting eradication as a goal? And is are there are there problems with eradication as a goal? Well, I think Mar Mariah brought one up is that uh, many of these infections are asymptomatic, and to have uh, the reason that you could eradicate smallpox and rinderpest in theory is that there's no asymptomatic infections and so mm -hmm. you can identify infected individuals and and act appropriately whatever color right. or vaccination right and that's been a challenge in in many of the of the targets for eradication the the uh, most famous target for eradicate you know, last target for eradication has been polio mm -hmm. right which also has a, a you know a, a very high degree of asymptomatic infection with somewhere on the order of a, of 99% mm -hmm. of infections failing to produce observable disease. When that disease happens, it's really terrible, and so there's a, there's a real incentive to try and get rid of it, right? But what that means is that you can have a long period where you don't see any disease, but that doesn't necessarily mean there's no infection, and so you have to maintain this extraordinarily high level of, of vigilance Right? in the absence of actually seeing anything that's going wrong. And, and I don't know, one, one of the things that I've always thought is when that happens, you do see a lot of other things going, going wrong. You see a lot of other illnesses that, that sort of take, start to take precedence and start to take priority in, a, in some sort of a public health agenda. Right? So as you get things down to a low level, you know, the, the things that are still remaining also, you know, also take prominence and, be, and take up some of that space. Right? I actually think that raises an interesting philosophical or ethical issue too. Once a disease is pretty rare, it could actually be quite low down in public health priorities for a country. Mm. Should you keep spending money to squeeze that last bit out, when in fact there are many more significant problems in that country which that money could be using? In the case of malaria, I think it's very interesting that you can go for elimination pretty easily in many parts of the world. Mm -hmm. Should you take a country like India, should you go for elimination in very large parts of India where there's almost no malaria? Yep. Or should you put it into control in areas where there's a lot of malaria? Right. The, it's the same money, the same budget. Surely from the body count point of view, the, the, the human well-being and misery, you should be in control areas where there's high transmission and it's difficult. So setting aside whether we can do that and all those little pockets which are still left to be found and eradicated, eradicated from, recently Bill Gates talked about this eradication of malaria. Um, hopefully Bill was watching, you know, he may or may not be. <laughs> <Bye> um, <laughs> Um, so, so is it useful to have this war against drugs or war against diseases or war against poverty, this sort of strong language that we're going to eradicate something? Is that useful? Is that just a really great way for a society to rally the troops or thinking about something which is going to bounce back because of evolutionary pressures? What, what is our best starting point? Should we be trying to aim for something like 5%? Of the population infected. So I think I think uh, the jury is still out yeah. on this big question yeah. because we just have two case studies yeah. where er uh, eradication has happened, and I think um, you know from a big perspective, maybe naively, but uh, eradication seemed like a great idea. You got a great big scourge mm -hmm. that's been smallpox or something that's been you know plaguing uh, the humankind for centuries, killing mm -hmm. enormous number of people. Mm -hmm. If you can eradicate it, uh, then it's it would seem like a great thing. Mm -hmm. But of course, it, it only happened uh, when was the last case, 1977. Mm -hmm. So we don't, uh, and with, I think it's been interesting with, uh, with smallpox, and I think rinderpest in both cases, it's declared eradicated, we've stopped vaccinating. Mm -hmm. But of course, for m immunity for many of these infections are very, very long lasting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we don't actually current, you know, 1977 is still very recent from a, from a herd immunity point of view. Mm -hmm. And it is interesting to see now that 
Um, well, so monkeypox is prop- cropping up in, in West Africa now, mm-hmm. and that seems to get the, the effective reproductive ratio seem to be come closer and clo- closer to one, mm-hmm. and we don't actually know if that is because the the vaccine induced immunity is slowly waning since I, I think they they stopped vaccinating that yes. there in like yeah. 1980 in or something 80s, yeah. Uh, yeah. something like that. So so. Everybody born since that last vaccine are obviously not got any vaccine induced immunity, and so so the, I think the big, a really big important question is if if and when we uh, eradicate, what do we need to do in terms of thinking about maintaining herd immunity? Do, do we need to to keep so with smallpox and in the past we decided okay the good thing was we just stopped vaccinating we eradicated it. Is that going to be? S- yeah. Sufficient. That's I think. Uh, um. Well, you're bringing up a, an issue of cross-protective immunity, and I think that's really useful to think about because maybe smallpox gives you some cross-protection against a different virus. But there's also, from a totally different perspective, a question of whether having immunity to one thing is protecting you against a totally different pathogen that we don't always understand. Issues of co-infection and balance, mm-hmm. and certainly with herpes viruses, there's been several published examples, not in humans but in animal models, where we see that. The presence of, for instance, the gamma herpes virus can confer immunity to a bacteria or to something mm. completely different. And so that's another level, even beyond thinking about smallpox, mm. monkeypox, we have to begin thinking even more broadly. If we got rid of polio or we get rid of, you know, if you could totally erase Ebola, now are we in 20 years going to be having a worse effect when some new version of Lassa fever comes out or something else that we're just not thinking of right now mm-hmm. that's totally different that some level of immunity to a current mm-hmm. pathogen is being helpful for. Mm-hmm. 